you, Panayota, for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to see you all here today. Uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, you heard Panayota calling me, uh, I'm calling you by your first name, if you don't mind, uh, saying that I'm Dendrinu. Um, but my name is Dendrinos, and that's because in Greek, um, women um, are possessed. <laughs> it's the possessive of the uh, nominative. So, uh, whereas the male is Dendrinos in this case, the female is Dendrinu. Uh, so, I just thought I'd say that. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you, and I don't know how interested you will be in what I will be saying. If you're bored, please wink. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure in coming to speak to you uh, what things you guys would be interested in. So it's a little bit of a variety of things, but mainly what I'm trying, what I will be trying to do. I'm not sure whether I'll succeed, but what I will be trying to do is to tell you what has been happening in Europe in trying, basically, to enhance uh, a federation which is very different from the United States. There are similarities, but it's very different because it is made up not of states that have uh, one language, despite the fact that the United States is multilingual, but officially, you know, it's the policies, etc., aren't. And a lot of Americans feel that um, English is fine, you know, and we don't need anything else. Uh, and I will be trying to say why this may start to be changing in, in the States and what has been happening in Europe, uh, what we are doing, and when I say we is because I'm involved in all of that and I'm very excited about it. So, let me say that I come to you today wearing my two hats. One is as an academic. Um, and having worked at the research center, we, we do a lot of work um, with regard to language teaching, testing, and assessment. And as president of the Civil Society platform, and right there, I'm not going to read it, um, are the basic um, ideas behind the Civil Society platform. I don't know whether uh, many of you know what the Civil Society is. Um, UNESCO has supported civil societies all over the world, as well as um, many states trying to introduce democratic governance to the governing bodies. In other words, uh, the people from professional groups primarily trying to either critique or to converse and to have a say-so with what governments are trying to do. Okay, uh, The European Commission in Europe has created a number of civil societies in order to have the opinion of the people with regard to the policies that they're trying to make. But these are basically the main goals of the civil society uh, platform that I'm president of and it's a very big one because it's 29 organizations which are networks in fact and each one of them has at least 15 to 30 organizations themselves so it's very very big and uh, it varies from uh, people who are working with language and language policy to artists, I have with me, I'm traveling to the States this time with a, with a friend who is from Iceland, actually, living in Denmark, is a photographer and is the secretary of the Civil Society platform. Uh, and she's uh, involved with the uh, European artists. 
Okay, so that's part of it, as well as translation, as well as lexicography. And all of these are part of the, and media, which is extremely important, trying to promote multilingualism in different sectors and different fields. Okay, and in both my own capacities, uh, my concerns lie with the promotion of multilingualism in all these sectors, in education, social media, publishing, business, and the arts. Um, the work for effective language learning in school, productive language learning. The work towards the recognition and the development of multi and particularly plurilingual communication skills. And later on, I will make the distinction between these two. A lot of people use them interchangeably, multi and plurilingualism, but actually there is a difference. And uh, the creation of, mu of a multilingual ethos of communication and development of this kind of competence, and I'll be talking about it at the end uh, uh, a little bit more. Okay, now, I, I'm going to start with the uh, differences. When we're talking about multilingualism in the US and the EU, both are, uh, both federations are linguistically and culturally diverse societies, and there are plurilingual identities therein, but they're not seriously valued, while both the US and Europe take little advantage of the abundant linguistic wealth available therein. Um, there are people that have a wealth of languages in both uh, the member states of the European Union and of course in the United States. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of languages that are spoken, but they're not actually being taken advantage of. In Europe, there's a long tradition of foreign language teaching with rather good language learning outcomes. The European Union, EU stands for European Union in particular, has been developing policies that favor foreign language learning. And there are a wide variety of practices that are good practices. And um, there are various projects that are being done constantly in order to develop further. In the US, where there is a serious language deficit, meaning foreign language deficit, of course. Uh, the teaching and learning of languages has been undervalued in formal and informal education in society at large. Um, so uh, what I want to do is to link the European and the US interest in languages right now, because the US is currently concerned with its language deficit for, for the first time in a very, very, very long time. And the American Academy of Arts and Sciences has just launched a national study on foreign language learning and formed a national commission to work with scholarly and professional uh, organizations reviewing research about the benefits of foreign language learning. And when I saw that, I thought, why shouldn't UMass be involved in this kind of uh, conversation um, that is being launched uh, on an academic level? As in the EU, learning of European languages is at the heart of European integration. And I will explain that a little bit further. There is a significant le legislation policy, implementation strategies, positive actions, and research that perhaps can help the American project. And this is why I thought it would be good to bring you and to tell you what has been happening. And it's very systematic and for a long time. It's not just about, OK, we're interested in languages. Let's study, see what the answers are, and overnight, attitudes change and something different happens. Okay. Uh, why has all of this been true in the EU and, and why is multilingualism important there? Well, it's being promoted for three reasons. Political, because integration 
requires that EU citizens enjoy equal status. I mean, I would not want to belong to the European Union if somebody said, your language is no good there. Um, or if the Italians or the Spanish or the French or the Germans, uh, you know, were not part of that integration. Cultural reasons, because all European languages are ingredients of what is called the European culture. I mean, no one can imagine Europe without the German language or the French language or the Greek language or the Italian language or other languages that have formed basically what is considered Europe and what you all more or less know. And for economic reasons, because in knowing different languages, uh, people, institutions, and organizations can communicate, interact, and cooperate without barriers. And if Europe, which started out as an economic kind of union, so that they would share economically, they need to have, for economic interests, to be able to have mobility, important mobility within the European states. So, um, it was from the start of a very important condition that all languages would be valued. Uh, multilingual competence is an important aspect of an EU citizenship. And the teaching of two foreign languages in schools is required in most member states for all students. So is the provision of translation and interpretation services to people who live work and study in the European Union. Therefore, just with these two things, you can understand with, a, with policies such as this, that it's a totally different reality. In the European Union's 2020 strategy, in other words, the, the, the educational strategy, uh, starting now from 2014 up to 2020, um, it has outlined the most important parameters for education in the future. And one of those six is languages. And actually measuring and seeing how competencies are uh, progressing. And seeing it an asset for employability, mobility, and growth in a more general sense. Why multilingualism in the USA, on the other hand? Well, the National Commission for Foreign Language Learning was formed in response to bipartisan congressional request that the American Academy examine the following questions. And I've listed them there. I don't want to repeat them. In calling for the study, there is consideration of the fact that 80% of Americans can only speak one language, and though the cost of American monolingualism has not formally been estimated, there are significant indications that it is costly. To tell you the truth, when I saw this, and this was published, that 80% of Americans can only speak one language, I doubted this. I'm not sure that this is true because there's so many Spanish speakers in the United States. There's so many Chinese speakers, and so on and so forth. And how are they counting that 80%? So I'm wondering if there's not some kind of perception as to what to be a foreign language speaker is, you know, or a language speaker. But this is what they said. Now, even though foreign language proficiency is more important in Europe, there is one member state which experiences a very great language deficiency comparable to that of the US, and that is the United Kingdom, of course. Um, there's a standing myth that the whole world speaks English whereas, of course, 75% of the world does not speak English. The internet, which used to be dominated by English, in 2000, English dominate, was dominating by 51%, the internet. Um, it no longer is the case. By 2010, the use of English had dropped to 29%, and by 2014 to 20. 
there is social resistance in England that has seriously been studied on language learning and of course depending on the attitude of the society this impacts basically whether people want to learn or not how important it is and it is perhaps the only member state that does not require students to study a foreign language in school does not require them this changed just last last year Uh, the cost of monolingualism, and this was behind it, is that in recent research uh, that has been done in various projects, and this is a project that I will be just giving you a link to later, showed that small and medium-sized businesses regard language, language and culturally appropriate communication as one of the biggest barriers in doing international business. And the UK, by studying this, um, showed that it is losing billions of pounds a year by not having multilingual spe speakers in various businesses. The estimation is there, you can see it, I don't have to repeat it. And medium and small sized businesses would actually be making a lot more money uh, if they did have multilingual speakers among them, All right? So, uh, and there was a very big project uh, that was done throughout Europe. It was called the ELAN project, Effects on the European Economy of Shortages of Foreign Language Skills and Enterprise, that showed that throughout Europe, those enterprises that had uh, speakers of languages other than English, uh, or other than just the national language, the official language, they were making, they had a much bigger profit. Okay. Um, of course, with English monolinguals, and what English monolinguals stand to lose out on is more than money, uh, because multilingualism has a direct relationship to citizenship and on the development of linguistic repertoires as an essential component of language education in a globalized world. And there are significant links between multilingualism, globalization, and identity, so that people who invest in language learning and socially construe multiple identities within diverse con contexts are able to weave in and out of particular linguistic and universalistic identifications, which is an imperative in today's world. And it's not just economic, but it is. It does have economic effects, and for the first time, it is being measured. Um, international research shows that the ability to use more than one or two language offers students a variety of cognitive and academic benefits, and this has been a lot of research is being done on that. And it empowers them, enhancing their creative and problem-solving skills. Okay. Um, so, yeah, monolingualism can be cured. Uh, the natural state of affairs is that we human beings are endowed, we, we have the ability of learning a variety of languages, and we are made to be monolingual. So we're, const you know, we're guided socially to be um, monolingual. And today, in today's world, I mean, in the 17th and 19th centuries, 17th and 18th centuries, when we were trying to create nation states before that. There were nation states, but when we were trying to create nation states, that idea of creating a monolingual society from naturally multilingual top, topi uh, was a good thing. I mean, that had to be done at that. But now, living in a world um, as it is today, it is almost uh, and a, a totally a natural thing to be a monolingual person. But as we will see, monolingualism and, uh, does not have to do only with needing uh, one language. The need for languages in the USA um, 
was pointed out uh, as that the congressional request of what should be done is that uh, Americans are more engaged around the globe than ever before. And most of the major challenges and opportunities from public health, et cetera, et cetera, and they need international understanding and cooperation. That's why they said, okay, we want to have a study of how Americans can know more languages. A call for setting language learning as a priority in the 21st century. It is likely that educational opportunities with more than one language will be funded in the future as well. And a demand that pupils be offered a set of skills that will uh, become more critical as communication between among culture increases is also a demand. Now, in the American educational context, uh, languages taught in schools were considered subjects of the elite, okay? Um, French and German and whatever. Uh, only students that were privileged uh, could study, had these as selection, okay? And students that were supposed to be underachievers, they didn't study foreign languages. Um, in the sense that foreign languages were conceived because a lot of times if people spoke Spanish and this was their home language, it was not considered a foreign language. Okay? It, very, very different sorts of realities. And I was saying even something else, like in uh, Greece has, it, one of its neighbors is Bulgaria. And we have a lot of exchange. For a long time, if somebody you know, studied Bulgarian, it would not be considered a foreign language. It would be considered a language of need. You know, when you talked about foreign languages, they were languages of some kind of cultural prestige, you know, to learn this or that. Um, not so long ago, a number of states, as you know, it was not only Massachusetts, but a number of other states that banned, actually, in the United States, bilingualism, which was an important way of creating and of having people learn foreign uh, languages which were not considered foreign, they were like home country or community languages as they're called in the UK. Uh, but it is slowly reappearing as the global economic advantages of speaking more than one language are being recognized. Bilingual education is returning to the United States in the form of language immersion programs where bilingual instruction is no longer for those that have a different home language, like Chinese Americans or uh, Spanish Americans, Spanish speaking Americans or whatever, but they are a more equal kind of thing as more parents are wanting their kids to learn languages and therefore these immersion schools are not only for kids whose home language is other than English, but also for American kids, because their parents want them to be able to compete in a global workforce. Uh, <coughs> so one or two-way second foreign language immersion programs are appearing across the US. Uh, and in, in my own research in relation to that one, I saw, for example, that it is in linguistically and ethnically homogeneous states such as Utah, which is very big now on immersion programs, I was really surprised. And of course, in other kinds of states. But this is what's happening, basically, you know, instead of the, what we knew as bilingual education. And um, as you see this as a basic kind of um, thing growing within the United States, there are a number of questions that one may ask. Um, one of them being, um, in, in our own research, we're saying, how is it ensured that all students have the benefits of foreign language instruction? Is it just the students that attend uh, immersion uh, education? of some sort, how do you ensure that all students have such sorts of opportunities? How are learners' levels of language proficiency recognized across 
and outside the US so as to know that someone who has such and such a level has acquired, it's the same it, it, and it's measured and it can, it's comparable what's happened in California and what's happened in Utah and in Massachusetts and so on and so forth. These are questions that have been asked in Europe and we'll be talking about that. Um, another question, are immersion programs and one-way streets to foreign language teaching and learning as two distinct concepts, teaching and learning? And is bilingualism enough? And is it the answer to a linguistically and culturally diverse global environment? There are a couple more questions to be asked, like what kinds of competencies and literacy skills are language students to develop in immersion programs. They have not really been defined. It's almost as though um, you go into a, a, an immersion program, 50% as you know of the subjects are studied, but uh, actually there is no, uh, uh, the competencies and skills have not been described objectively as to what kind of things are they going to be doing. What types of official knowledge is most appropriate um, in foreign language education? What types of identities? Um, I just marked these down, read them through very quickly. There are a wide variety of questions that can be asked that relate to this uh, when you're thinking, okay, the future of foreign language education in the States, or maybe foreign language is not the correct word. Maybe we should be talking not only in the States, but in Europe, of additional languages. Okay, to one so. Now, Europe is a very different reality, and it is true that many more Europeans across Europe uh, do speak uh, more than one or even two languages, okay? Um, how has this happened? What is the history of this? And why is it working, in a sense, outside of the fact that there is some kind of legislative? Well, in the 1970s, the Council of Europe, I don't know how many of you are, in, uh, are aware that the Council of Europe is something very different from the European Commission. It includes all European countries, about 48, okay, including Russia and all the things that are not in the European Union. Um, they began to work on the official knowledge of foreign language teaching and learning. For the first time, they tried to describe what does it mean to have particular levels of language and what kind of what should you know if you're a beginner, if you're an intermediate level student or advanced, okay? What does that mean? How do you describe those competencies and skills? It began in the, as early as the 1970s. In 2001, the Council of Europe published the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with that, uh, but it was the first time that there was a, a way of trying to objectively describe levels of language competence so that they would be comparable. And if somebody would say, I'm a basic user of Portuguese, okay, and I say that, that means that I can do this and this and this and this, and this can be compared among all countries within the European Union and to say that I'm a basic user of Portuguese and I say that in Greece and it's the same because I can describe it in the same way in France and I can describe it in the same way in Germany and so on and so forth. But not only that, those descriptors that I have for basic knowledge of the language is not just for Portuguese, they're the same descriptors for French, for Greek, for um, German, for 
um, uh, uh, Danish, and so on and so forth. So it was the first time ever that this was ever, that it was trying to be described, and it was a, on a six level um, reference, which has starting from A1 level, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2. And now, not only in Europe, but throughout uh, many other places, including, for example, South America, they're adopting the Common European Framework of Reference because there's nothing else that has in such a way described such ob objectively. There is something comparable in Canada that has been done. Okay, uh, but the Common European re re uh, level of reference um, has is constantly being worked upon, and in 2016 it is going to be reappearing uh, with um, the with, with new descriptors that have been enhanced. So they have been researched, validated. Our research center has been. Uh, validating the new descriptors, which include for the first time, they include description of what it means to be able to be a mediator across languages and across cultures. So it's going to be enriched. Uh, by providing a common basis for the explicit description of objectives, content, and methods, the SAFRA, as we call it, which is the Common European Reference of Languages, hope to, expand, to, to, to sort of enhance the transparency of courses, syllabuses, qualifications, thus promoting international cooperation in the field of modern languages. And cooperation in the area is really needed. Um, within the United States, to the degree that I know, there's not even a collaboration among universities uh, to that degree. Okay. Now, in 1994, the European Center for Modern Languages was founded in Graz, Austria, so that together with the Language Policy Unit of the Council of Europe and the Secretariat of the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages in Strasbourg, they provide a common approach to dealing with language issues in Europe. Okay? And that was an important, it was an, another landmark. The role and activities of the ECML include quite a number of things. And again, the ECML does not restrict itself to the European Union, but throughout countries in Europe. And they've done a lot of interesting research, and I was telling Panayoda that um, I can send, or whoever wants, uh, their, their site so as to see what they have been doing, as well as other uh, information that I will be giving here, depending on your interests, I can give you more extensive information um, afterwards. I can send it either to Panayoda or... Okay, perhaps... Uh, some milestones in what has been happening from the beginning up until now. Perhaps one of the most important conditions for the EU project from the very start was that all languages of the member states are viewed as equal and that linguistic diversity is an essential part of Europe's cultural wealth. Okay, that was the condition and it could not be questioned. Therefore, all 24 European languages are official languages of the EU, and multilingualism is considered an asset for Europe and a shared commitment. By the way, there are hundreds of translations on a daily basis, because it's not just translating from one language to the 24, it's translating across languages. And there are literally millions of pages that are translated in Europe, through, on a daily basis and some people who would say well why don't we just have one language you know uh, that would be enough or maybe just a couple of languages the more important languages because it's so expensive it was a few years ago that I heard the uh, commissioner of uh, education and culture say how much it costs the European Union uh, for all this translation that is going on. And it costs each European citizen a year less than it costs for a cup of coffee. 
So the cost is not all that much, despite all of the translation that's going on. So, okay, languages are important. What do we do in order to get people to learn them? The first thing that was done is in 1989, the Lingua program was launched, and the, and the Lingua program was a program where students started to move in different European countries as visitors, basically, in order to learn each other's languages. Uh, in 1995, the White Book on Teaching and Learning is published in Europe, and languages are part of it. What do we learn? And to start having a more common, in Europe, to start having a more common educational, not an, not an educational system, but an educational goal and various other objectives. In 1995, we see the Socrates and Leonardo da Vinci programs being launched, and all of this is being, all of these programs are being financed by the European Union. And I have here a slide that shows you, uh, right here, we have all of these programs, which are for different levels of education, but also for lifelong learning, because. One of the main considerations is that if we're talking about language learning, we can't say, okay, I learned the language when I'm in school, and then I finished the language and goodbye. In fact, there is a, <laughs> you know, language leaves you if you don't use it. My first foreign language was French in, in Greece, because uh, it was so important. and. By the time I was going to graduate school, and it, it was absolutely necessary for me to have also French, I had forgotten most of my French because I w wasn't using it. You know, so uh, if 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 you don't use a language, it will not use you either. <laughs> okay, and you'll be forgetting it. So there are all these programs that are taking place on a lifelong learning basis for languages in order to develop and for there to be exchange in adult education, in initial vocational training, in, um, in school, in university, and throughout. There are also a number of EU legislation and practices which are very, very important. In 2001-2002, the European Day of Languages uh, was established and it's celebrated every year on September 26th throughout Europe. Kids do stuff in school, universities do stuff. Uh, there's a very big thing in um, Brussels every year that, that it happens, you know. But it is it has become an important event where people are actually celebrating languages. In 2002, and this was a very, very important milestone and turning point. For the first time ever, all heads of European state actually voted on the two plus one language education policy. It meant that every European citizen had the right to learn two languages in addition to their mother tongue. Which meant that if someone were not offered that possibility in school, for example, or uh, later on, uh, there could be a litigation case. You know, it's having the right to learn the languages. Uh, <clears throat> a variety of European tools to promote good practices in foreign language teaching, like the European Languages label, and uh, to reward development of differential competences and skills intercomprehension in different languages, the European language portfolio, and Europass developed. These tools are really interesting because they start developing a totally different idea of what it is to know a foreign language. Uh, the European language portfolio is actually constructed so that people describe even their littlest experiences and things that they can bring into 
their portfolio about knowing and having an experience in different languages. And it's not having a certificate, nor is it having or proving that I studied this for a year in, uh, in school, but it is actually documenting the experience, like for example, I remember the first time ever when I was in, in Portugal and I had my first 15, 15 minute conversation with a taxi cab driver, okay? And that experience would be documented in my portfolio. So a language portfolio, which uh, has also different ways of describing your knowledge systematically, the knowledge and the skills and the experiences that you're developing is part of that. And Europass is also a part of the European language portfolio because it, and actually it rewards people for knowing, for being able to do few things in languages. It's not about knowing a language being a near native speaker, but it is developing a way of using languages in order to make meanings around us and that's what it, it's all about a lot of times. Um, the European language label is um, being rewarded actually for doing good language projects and it's within particular countries and the best language projects are uh, rewarded and so uh, are they across Europe and every day the European every year the European Day of Languages uh, the best uh, uh, European uh, language projects are actually win okay uh, there's not money but they're published and uh, a lot of things happen and sometimes also within the country there's a little bit of money involved um, in 2003, the first action plan for the promotion of language learning and the sustenance of linguistic diversity is published. So as to be exhausted in 2006, but then new strategic plans begin. And for the first time, there's a strategic plan for multilingualism, which is announced. It is brought open to be discussed throughout and then in 2008, the European Council conclusions regarding multilingualism are published. And every European policy that regards language learning is also falls back on the 2008 multilingualism conclusions. 2007, 2013, the new strategic framework for lifelong learning and language education is published in the context of which relevant projects are funded in the EU and co-funded in member states. This is millions of euro every year for projects that have to do with languages, language learning, language teaching, language assessment, and innovative things that concern languages, like the kind of thing that you are doing with the theater or with involving the arts, involving photography, involving all kinds of creative things that have to do with languages. 2003-2008, linguistic diversity actions are developed and we witnessed the birth of what was called EBLUI, the European Bureau for of Lesser Used Languages and uh, the Marketer Network of three research and documentation centers for minority languages in different countries in Europe. And in 2005, we have the communication from the European Commission to the European Parliament and to the European Council. Uh, the European indicator of language competence with a view to recording information about languages is born. And this means that in Brussels, there is a, a sort of a, um, uh, a, there is an indicator that is measured in the same way how language learning is developing and how are languages within each member state used. Okay. 2005-2010, there's funding of projects, again with millions of euro, to produce studies related to early language learning, meaningful lifelong learning of languages, not necessarily aiming at native speaker level, and for the first time it's actually announced, 
creative use of information computer technology for the teaching and learning of languages, creative tools and appropriate ways for the teaching and learning of languages by students with special needs, and that was an important project there again, describing in detail student language teacher, language teaching skills, and that is another important issue because, again, um, for the first time, there is a description of the, those that are going to be teaching languages, what sorts of skills do they need, not only linguistically, but what sort of teaching skills do they need in order to teach languages. And in order to have teachers, language teachers, that have the same type of skills throughout Europe. And this also has been published and producing an inventory of language tests in Europe and how they measure things. Um, by the way, these were financed and because this was legislation that was occurring in Europe, what happened is that a lot of, the, a lot of that legislation took actually became part of everyday practice. So within from 2005 to 2010, and even further, uh, a lot of schools in Europe introduced uh, languages much earlier than they had before. And I was saying to someone, um, uh, my research center was responsible, the research center that I'm directing, uh, was responsible for introducing English, which is the first foreign language for kids, most of the time in Europe and then other languages a little bit later, uh, introducing it in the first grade. So we had a program um, that we created for first and second grade students throughout the country. And uh, to also uh, train teachers in order to be te to teach first and second graders. So, but that was the, throughout uh, throughout Europe. Uh, there was a, an 85 percent increase in the teaching of languages at earlier uh, levels. 2005-2011 opportunities are created with EU funding to establish collaborative graduate programs for languages and carry out major research conditions for languages. And I've marked down a project that was very important because it involved uh, so many universities. There were 12 European countries and it ran for five years. So if something comparable is to be created in the United States, again, it's not just finding out how is it how is it better to do it, but actually get uh, universities, getting schools, getting collaborative work, which is very, very much needed in order for things to happen. Um, the final milestones that I have jotted down, 2007-2013, um, a new operational strategic framework for lifelong learning occurs and language education funded uh, in relevant projects. And from all of these studies that had been done, in 2012-2013, the results, the outcomes of all these projects that have been done on a European level uh, are actually published. So there's the Euro Observer that is published, what's happening with languages, Eurostat that uh, generally announces what is happening in education. But for the first time ever, there's a very, very systematic research on what do Europeans think about languages and language learning. And that is the Eurobarometer, and I have marked down there the link I can, I can send them to Panayota and she can send them to you, um, to actually see what different people within the European think about languages and why it is important, how much they want the learning to be, okay? Uh, and another very important thing was happening and results were announced. And this was the European Survey of Language Competence. About 16 European member states took part in having 15-year-old students 
throughout Europe to be tested with exactly the same test to see at the, when they finish their compulsory education in the first language and the second foreign language, what sort of competencies they have developed in a, me- in a, in, in, in a way that was measured in the same kind of way. But there was something more that was extremely important. In each of these uh, states that took part in all of this, it's not only that they asked kids to take the test, the same test that was measured, that was validated, that was a lot of things were done, but also to fill out questionnaires about conditions of their learning and also personal type of information. And it wasn't only students that filled out the questionnaires, but validated questionnaires, but also teachers, foreign language teachers, and schoolmasters, um, principals, of schools which took part. And all of this information was processed, it was a very, very difficult job, in order to see what kinds of conditions were favorable to foreign language learning had a positive impact or a negative impact. Okay? And for the first time ever, you could see across Europe in a thing like this, what were, I mean, where you had a better job in a country, like for example, Sweden. In the first foreign language, Swedes speak excellent English, okay? They don't, the second language is not so good, but they do, okay? Why is it that in Sweden, for example, you have such good results in uh, foreign language learning in school and not, for example, in France, okay? France, by the way, is the second worst in Europe, <laughs> for obvious reasons, you know. So, um, okay, and for the first time, you actually had data there that was comparable, statistically analyzed, and to see positive and negative impacts, and it came from students, but also from teachers. And there was another very interesting project, Language Rich Europe, and again, I have the link there as to what the conclusions were. were. And it was not just this time in schools and language learning, but in the social media. Uh, what, what were the uses of language in the socio- social media and simple media, television, radio, etc., across Europe? Uh, it had to do with businesses, and they studied those as well and also the use of language in the public space okay. uh, throughout Europe again. And their conclusions of this large project that also lasted for quite a long time and about 18 member states took part, had their results. Uh, the research outcomes, generally speaking, of all these projects, uh, and they did present all of them comparable data and well-documented evidence said that the large percentage of European citizens believe that foreign language learning is essential for growth and employability. Educational systems in member states are offering as obligatory subjects two foreign languages at an earlier age than before, as I said it. That European students aged 15 have autonomous user level uh, of language competence that is approximately intermediate for those of you that do not know which it is, in their first foreign language and basic user level in the second foreign language, that there are various contextual conditions which have positive or negative uh, uh, impact, and that language learning outcomes are at desired levels while they differ significantly from member are not a desired level, but they differ significantly in member states. So what also did they show? That in the businesses, and I'm not going to go into it any further, there is a great desirability for languages in order for the economy to grow. What should be done in languages for jobs? Um, In other words, 
if the job market needs it more, what is desired, and these are the suggestions that came out of these projects. Eleven of them that I have marked down. Um, and uh, what is it from there on, from 2014 on, what is it that is suggested from now on to happen so that language learning becomes even more enhanced? So uh, the European Commission and its actions, it has introduced and announced a follow-up to the 2020 Rethinking Education Plan, which includes the languages. It has introduced and announced a follow-up of what is called Erasmus Plus that includes all of the previous programs. But basically, Erasmus Plus is a program that wants to move people around in different countries. Thinking that, okay, no matter what language learning conditions are, if you're in a classroom, it's not as effective as if you move and you go to, a, to another country. You see how people use it. You're motivated, you want to communicate, and therefore you are bound to learn. There's, in Erasmus Plus also, they have developed um, tests online so that students that want to study in another, to go to another country and be there for a little while, they're tested in their language skills before they go and afterwards because they actually get a grant. So um, they want to motivate them even more to have developed a little bit of language competence before they go and as a requirement they're supposed to have elevated their language competence afterwards. Um, the European Council of Ministers did not adopt a language benchmark that had been actually proposed by the European Commission, but delivered significant conclusions on multilingualism and the development of competencies. And these are at a governmental level. Okay. So this becomes important because they're recommendations that in a sense the European Commission, the European Union, cannot tell each member state this is how your your educational system should be. But it creates motivations by funding projects and by indicating what educational systems are better than others. Okay, and so these are recommendations. And usually, when recommendations occur, they are followed like, um, as I told you, in relation to early language learning and a lot of other things. Um, the future concerns um, multilingualism in, in the field is um, on learning, teaching, and assessment. And my concerns, in particular, are related to the development of intercultural and plurilingual competencies. Multilingualism is to be distinguished from plurilingualism, and it refers, well, multilingualism refers to a knowledge of various languages, to a number of languages, or the coexistence of different languages in a given society. Um, the CEF actually makes a distinction of, between multilingualism and plurilingualism, uh, and Multilingualism may be attained by simply diversifying the languages that are on offer in particular schools or educational system by encouraging pupils to learn more than one foreign language or reducing the dominant position of English in international communication. But plurilingualism is something different. It develops as an individual person's experience of language in its cultural context expands from language of the home to that of society at large, and then to the languages of other peoples, learned at school or by direct experience. But the learner does not keep these languages and cultures in strictly separated mental compartments, but builds up a communicative competence to which all knowledge and experience of languages contributes so that languages interact and interrelate with one another. Um, I am 
thinking that I have talked for too long, and even though this goes on uh, with regard to plurilingualism and questions that have, um, that have been asked, I think that they should stop now. Uh, I, but I will send my PowerPoint presentation so that you who are interested uh, can see um, the rest of it as well, uh, or can document some of the information here. And I will be very, very happy if any of you have, outside of the questions that we are going to be discussing now, I mean, you can ask me any question that you like, uh, but if you're interested in something in particular from this, uh, you can just write, I'm interested in this and I would like a little bit further information. And I can send that information to anyone that asks. Maybe somebody can collect uh, those kinds of questions and um, I, can, I would be very, very happy to actually answer or point you to the right direction as to where to find such information. Okay? So.